Well, tonight we are back in Exodus, and last week we looked at those first six verses of chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and Moses had gone down to the land of Midian, which I believe is in Saudi Arabia, and um, he, we don't know, but for 40 years he was very content just taking care of another man's sheep, which again, we realize how he became the humblest man on earth, and that was probably it, because remember, he had been raised as an Egyptian. Remember what Joseph told his brothers when they went down to Egypt? Say you're a shepherd because shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. So Moses went from being the prince of Egypt, in his mind at least, in an Egyptian th way of thinking, which is how he had lived for 40 years. It was going to the lowest rung of the caste system. He went to taking on a job from the prince of Egypt to taking on the job that was an abomination to the Egyptians, being a shepherd. And it took 40 years, I guess, but we come to chapter 3, and now, all of a sudden, he's 80 years old. And God had done a tremendous breaking and healing and humbling work in him in those 40 years and as we had read, that he was content, and he, was, he, was, he had kept past, it was in the perfect tense. In other words, he, he wasn't wanting to move from that. This is the way he saw himself dying, you know, out taking care of <laughs> Jethro's handful of sheep. That's the way he pictured the end of his life being. And so it sort of gives us an indicator that Moses, God was talking to him. Remember little Samuel? Samuel, Samuel. He gets, what's Eli? And finally, after several times, Eli says, next time, say, Lord, here I am. Uh, you know, speak. Well, I think God was speaking to Moses. And he knew it was God speaking to him. He didn't want to hear it. And finally, this burning bush happens. And yet it wasn't being consumed. And, and, he, and when God saw that he finally got Moses' attention, uh, he began to speak to him. Remember, he said, take out your sandals. This is the holy ground. And he did. And, and, uh, and Moses turned his face away, realizing no man could look upon God and live. And the Lord spoke um, to him from that, that burning bush. And he told him that he uh, had a plan to deliver the children of Israel. So we pick up in verse 7 here tonight. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of, notice these next two words, my people. This is the first time in the entire Bible where God calls the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my people. Wow. You know, we get that all the way through the New Testament, don't we? We, we realize how personal of a savior Jesus is to us, don't we? I mean, Jesus explained to us in detail how he knows every hair upon our head by number. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground, that he's personally, intimately, emotionally involved with each of his little precious sheep. But you try to ask yourself, if I were to say, okay, here's your book report, everybody, Tell me everything you know about God from the book of Genesis. It wouldn't be much. I mean, Abraham had sort of a crazy story about this priest, Melchizedek guy, priest of God and king of Salem. And, 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 and then Jacob has a story about wrestling with this angel that ended up being God. And, and uh, he also had a crazy uh, dream about a ladder and angels going up and down. And... <laughs> um, they all have some radical stories and, and they saw God's hand at times and pretty powerfully, Abraham in particular, talked to God on a number of occasions. And, but that's about it. it you, literally, it would, it would take you, uh, if I said, it, you know, put it in order, it would maybe be five, six, seven things you know about God. And then after you know those handful of things, go live in a pagan land for 400 years 
and see how much your relatives know after 400 years of being slaves in a pagan country, see how much they know about God now (laughs) and remember about the God of, of a very distant Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All they had was the oral tradition that was being passed down. So all of a sudden, we, we sort of have, you know, there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And after 400 years of silence, the first voice speaking was John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. Well, Moses now, after 400 years, if you would, God is speaking again out of silence. And he says, they're my people. And I want you to notice as we read verse 7 through 9, how many intimate things and details that God says about these people. And all of a sudden we learn almost more in these few verses than we ever knew in the book of Genesis. I mean, we don't have a sense where God says, I love Abraham or, uh, you know, I love his children. It's like, I chose you. I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. But now look at how tender God is in his revelation of himself. I have surely know the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. How tender this is. I hear their cry. I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen their oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So even though the promised land wasn't that far from Egypt, to this day they share a border. Moses had never been there. I mean, if he had really set out and said, I'm going to go check out some of the promised land, he probably could have done that with a group of warriors and, you know, traveled three days and been there. But he never has been in the promised land. And matter of fact, we don't ever see Moses get into the promised land until in the New Testament at the Mount of Transfiguration <laughs> where him and Elijah and Moses and, uh, and um, there's a third guy there though. Jesus, okay, the three of them there. And um, what's that? Anybody? I'm just having a, a momentary senior moment, sorry. Transfiguration, uh, Moses and Elijah, and Jesus. and Jesus, and he said, "Let's build three tents." And so, the guys were right. Well, yeah, they, they were they were observing it. That's that's another story. I know Matthew 17. I'll read it again later to remind myself. But anyway, sorry about that, guys. But anyway, that's that's when he finally got in, and then wasn't even physically. So th- it was sort of like. Yeah, you know, our forefathers used to live in this place. And, and again, when you're a slave, you don't move, you don't travel. You, you're, you're stuck and, you know, you go to your house and work and come home to your little hut and exhausted and go back. And you don't travel, even if it's only, you know, three or four days journey away. They don't, they, you know, by horse, they, they could have gone there. It's never did. And so to them, it's, it's this thing they've heard of distantly, from their relatives. There's a land that God has for us. And and God tells them it's such a good land. I mean, the way God describes it, it's this large land. It's flowing with milk and honey. There was a a story of where the rabbi was sitting against the tree, teaching his group of pupils. And while he was sitting against the tree, he noticed a a goat came over and started rubbing against the side of the tree while he sat there. And and until, as it was scratching itself, the milk started coming 
out of the goat there on the ground at the base of that tree. And as the, they looked around at this thing, it just had so much milk, it, it couldn't, its babies couldn't handle it. It was, that, it was plenty of milk and more than, than the babies can even eat, that it was just being wasted on the ground. And as they looked, they noticed on the side of the tree that the honey, big, thick thing of honey was leaving the comb and had traveled down the tree. And also, it was all gooey at that other side of the tree. And the, and the, rab, the rabbi said, there we are, <laughs> a land flowing with milk and honey. There's so much honey, we can't eat it. It's just flowing, waste, wasting on the ground. The, the, the animals are so healthy, their little ones can't drink all of the milk. It's a land with excess. And then he gives these names as we continue through the Old Testament. Each of these names will become uh, familiar to us and, and we'll see some personal stories about most of them. But I would want to take out of that uh, the, the name Amorites. And the reason I would say let's look at Amorites in particular because you guys I know remember uh, back in Genesis 15 where Abraham was really having a hard time. He just met with Melchizedek. He had told the, the nations of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of those, take a hike, I don't want anything to do with you guys. And, and God speaks to him in chapter 15 and said, hey, I am your great reward. You know, I am your shield. It's, it's me. And then Abraham just says, I'll never have kids. I'll just give my servant all my, everything I have. You got it all, I'll never have a heritage. And God says, go outside at night, look. As the stars of the heavens, that's how many kids you'll have. And one of the most important verses in all the Bible, Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And then he said, God said, let's make a, a covenant. Remember this? In those days, you would cut the animals in half and, and you'd walk between the two carcasses saying, I'll keep my half and you keep your half. But God wasn't showing up and the vultures came and was, you know, putrefying the meat as they're trying to eat it and he's shooing them away until he finally just clapped as he's, he's exhausted and he falls asleep. And, and while he's having this dream, he does have as many, just tons of kids, but yet they all end up in slavery in a foreign land. And he wakes up out of this nightmare and he realizes God has already came and went. And God, in essence, said, I'll keep my half and I'll keep your half. That's how the covenant will be sure. I, God, God doesn't say that his promises are filled as we keep our half and God keeps his half. It's God is faithful, even when we're not faithful. That's his nature. But he, he realizes at that time, wow, I was, I was thinking having kids would be this giant reward. It would be everything to me. And then I realized I'm going to have these great kids and for 400 years they're going to be slave and, slaves and, and horribly treated in a foreign land. Oof. There, I'm back to having, being miserable again. Thought I'd be happy having kids and now I'm miserable after having kids. And in essence, it's coming back going, kids won't fulfill you. Marriage won't fulfill you. Money won't fulfill you. I am your great reward. And then God says there in, in chapter 15, verse 16, but the fourth generation, they shall return here. He, he said back up in verse 13, 400 years. And now he said the fourth generation. So uh, 100 years is a generation at this time. They shall return. And then he says this little thing, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. We, we don't really know for sure what that means other than God being gracious is saying, I'm giving them opportunities to repent. I'm gonna give them chances to turn from their wicked ways. And he says, though, they won't. The bottom line is after 400 years, at that time, I can judge them the way that I desire to judge them. And just to give you a little insight on this, Moses later on in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, uh, he, he gives a little commentary on this idea. And he says in, Levit in Leviticus 18, verse 24 to 28, do not, 
defile yourself with any of these things, for you, by all the, these the nations will defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment and its iniquities upon it, and the land is vomits out its inhabitants. So a very similar wording there as in Genesis 15. The punishment of the iniquity is now coming upon it. You shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, shall not commit any of the abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who is, dwells among you, for all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. And then in verse 28, lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, as I vomited it out the nations that were before you. So God used Israel to judge these nations who are living fat and happy in this land flowing with milk and honey. This, if you would, God spot on earth <laughs> that he picked for his people and for himself to live and rule and reign there for a thousand years. Well, eventually we know Israel does get vomited out, don't we? Through the Assyrians and the Babylonians and uh, their out of the land for 70 years, but that's, that's later on. Well, back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, there it is again, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, this has got to be a very sore spot for Moses. Because this is what he thought God had said to him 40 years earlier. <laughs> Do you remember when he was 40? And the, and the two Hebrews said, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? He's like, ah, Acts 7 tells us he thought that God would reveal to them, as God had revealed to Moses, that he was using him to deliver them out of this slavery, out of Egypt. And it was just so clear to him and, and when things just went belly up and he's fleeing for his life and now over 40 years he's nobody insignificant the most insignificant man on the earth and that's the way he saw himself the humblest man on earth there's nobody that is less significant than me and I'm fine with that <laughs> nobody sees me nobody cares nobody notices I'm just a faceless guy with some sheep, nothing to steal here, nothing to covet here, nothing to wish that you had here. Just ignore me. I'm just a pitiful uh, little old guy with a handful of sheep that I care for. And now God is coming and saying, hey, by the way, I'm going to use you. And it's like, oh, 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 not again, not again. I'm older and wiser. I'm not 40 now. I'm 80 and, and I have nothing to bring to the game. And, and so Moses, I know, has heard this in his heart from God before. But notice in verse 11, and Moses said to God, here it is, who am I? I think it was very bitter coming out of his mouth. I think it was just very difficult to say this because I used to be a guy who understood the Egyptians and the Egyptians know me and they respected me and, and, and I had a voice and I had capabilities. We're going to read in Acts chapter 7 where he was a man mighty in word and mighty in deed. We're going to get to chapter 4 and he says I can't even talk very well. Had a stroke or had a his teeth are falling out and he can't talk anymore with those new dentures made out of wood or something. I don't know, but he's just, I, I, I'm, I'm not capable. I used to be very capable. And, and it's sort of very sore to me now that I'm the most incapable person or this is the most incapa incapable t time in my life. Even if he came 10 years ago when I was 70, I, I didn't look so bad. 80, man, it's really wearing on me. Who am I? I? I have nothing to bring to this. 
that I should go to Pharaoh. This is a new Pharaoh. It's a new regime. He has no inside track. All the people that he knew are probably dead and gone now. And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. This is, this is just bad timing. It's, it's an impossible situation. And how, what does God say in verse 12? He said, I will certainly be with you. You see, that's the key, isn't it? The, key, the question really isn't, who am I? The question is, is God going to be with us on this? Is God going to be doing this? This is such an important point here tonight that as we go into the next few verses, it's such a great insight here. Jesus later on would say to his apostles, uh, go now into all the world. And then what he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. End of Matthew. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them. But then he says, they could have said, well, who am I? I'm just a fisherman from Galilee. What, what, what's that mean if I go to Egypt or if I go to India or if I go to Indonesia or go to China? What's that matter if I go into the uttermost parts of the world and I'm just a, sh- I'm just a little fisherman from Galilee? Well, I am with you always. That's the key. It's me. I will certainly be with you. And in Romans 8, 31, Paul says, so did you get it? If you add it all up, what then shall we say to these things? It is God who is for us. He makes that so clear at the end of chapter 8. Man, we're getting, we're like sheep being slayed all the day long. We're getting killed with the sword. We're getting put to death in this way and that way. And all the day long, we're sheep as to the slaughter. But it doesn't matter. We're more than conquerors in the midst of that. Why? Because he will never leave us nor forsake us. Neither height nor depth nor principalities nor powers. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hebrews 13, uh, the very end of that, verse 5 says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You understand, it wasn't, you go to Egypt on this mission, I'll be with you. Moses is going to learn here. I've been with you the whole time. I've always been with you. The, The problem is, is you don't realize I've always been with you. But now, for the first time, I want you to by faith, understand and realize the God who has always been with you, Moses. This hasn't been a wasted 40 years. It may feel like a wasted 40 years to you. It may seem 40 years too late to you. It may seem like if I were a wise God, I would have taken advantage of you in your 40s rather than you in your 80s. But again, God's ways are not our ways, are they? as high as the heavens are above the earth. Moses, you've always been the guy. This has always been your calling. And here's a fact that's always been true. It's just you need to now realize it. I am with you. I will surely be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you, that you have brought this people out of Egypt and you shall serve God on this mountain. So this place where he's seen the burning bush, This place where God is speaking to him. He said, um, after you've come out of Egypt and and you're all the way back here and it'll seem like a second. You know, it's going to be a little over a year, I think, until he gets back with the people. But in in a few months from now, you're going to be standing right here looking at that burning bush, looking at this mountain, and you're going to be looking at a sea of Hebrews and you're going to be remembering an amazing story of how God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. That's what you need to get. Well, verse 13 now, and 14 and 15. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, Well, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? 
So Moses is coming up with excuses. And he's trying to, he's trying, he's trying to say that, I, I understand, I, I may be a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I've never lived as a Hebrew. In these last 40 years, I've lived as a, Mennonite, as a Midianite, Midianite. I've never really been a Hebrew. I've never really been a Jew. I've been an Egyptian. I've been a Midianite. I've lived in Egypt. I've lived in Midian. I really don't know much about you. <laughs> Matter of fact, out of all the Hebrews that are probably on this earth, I probably know you less than anybody else. So all of a sudden, you want me to be the leader taking all these children out of Israel for a God talking to me out of the burning bush and, and the, what am I supposed to tell them? Hey, I talked to a burning bush the other day and let's uh, let my people go. I don't know you. I, 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 I don't know me. I, I don't know the Jewish thing. I don't know the Jewish God thing. And so I'm going to say, the God of the fathers has sent me and they're going to say to me, by the way, they never do say this to him. What's his name? <laughs> God, the children of Israel never, never ask him this, but really they should have been asking him that. What, what is your name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses in verse 14, another very important verse in the Bible, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am have sent me to you. Verse 15 now, moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord, this is the tetragrammaton, the Y-H-W-H, God, the, the Lord, or Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. Did you get that? my name forever, my memorial name, my name to all generations. Wow. So who are you? He, he tells them, well, in the Hebrew, it's haya. I am. Yeah, it sounds like the karate term. Haya. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Haya. Sounds like that. But he said, Haya. And then he, he says, Asher, which is that little conjunction, that little uh, relative pronoun. That little relative pronoun, it, you know, it, it can be translated a lot of different ways. It can be translated as that I am, that I am. I am that which I am, which that I am. I am since I am. I am who I am. I am when I am, I am as I am. I like that one the best. I am as I am. <laughs> Haya, aser, asher, aya. Now, if Moses actually went and said to them, Haya, asher, haya, that would have made it sound like he's saying, I am. <laughs> I'm God. So even though this is the conversation they're having, in verse 15, God says, don't actually say, I am that I am, but say to them this word. And this is the tetragrammaton. Talked about it in detail in Genesis. It's four consonants. It, we're not sure how it's enunciated. It's the holy name of God. It's never to be said by a Jew. But we say Yahweh. There was some German scholars back in the dark ages, so to speak, that, that thought you should put the vowels of Elohim in between it or the vowels of Adonai in between it. That's why you have different spellings of it. And then they came up and said, let's transliterate it. Y-H-W, or that W could also be V. We're not sure which one it is. That's why you have different spellings. Depends if they use the V or the W. Most of the time it's a W. And it depends if they use the, the vowels from Elohim or the vowels from Adonai. 
to in between the four consonants. That's why you have different. But in the German, the Y sound is a J sound. So that's where for several hundred years you got the Jehovah sound. But it hasn't been used really for the last 200, maybe 300 years. It's Yah or Yahweh, uh, the Jews today would say. And so he says that, understand, when you hear Yahweh, you're, you're hearing, I am that I am. I am who I am. I am as I am. What, what does that mean? When you say Yahweh, now we, we know what the actual name is, don't we? Jesus. <laughs> you shall call his name God who is with us, Jesus. So we really know, I mean, Yahweh is Jesus. We know his name personally, intimately as our Savior. But nevertheless, the, I, the one aspect of I am who I am, or am that I am, or as, am, as I am, is that it's God's eternal. There is no other being that can say, I have always been and I will always be. I, I'm the only eternal person. That's why when the Mormons say, oh, well, you'll become the God of your own planet, it's like, you can't start being God. You either always have been God or you, you can't start always having existed. You either have always existed or you haven't always existed. So let's let me help you. There is no God but one, only the being who has always existed, right? Isaiah, 50, Isaiah 45 verse 5 and 6 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is, no, there is none besides me. I am the Lord, Yahweh. There it is. Y-H-W-H, all capital. See, it, if it were Adonai, it would, Adonai, it would be capital L, then a small O-R-D. When you read your Old Testament, if it's a big L and three small letters, Oh, that's Adonai. But if it's all four consonants are capitalized, that's Yahweh. That's the YHWH, the Tetragrammaton. I am the Lord and there is no other. Secondly, not only is it speaking of he's the only eternal one, but he is God who is personal. Most religions, they, they have God sort of like, you know, you used to have tops as kids. Remember that? You had a top and you'd put the string around it. And then you'd spin it and the top. Anybody not know what I'm talking about? You, you, okay. Okay, everybody knows. That, that's sort of the view of God. God's watching as the world turns. Ooh, look at that. Mm, look at that right there. Oh, He's, he's uh, observing, but, relative, but relatively never actually intervening. And that is not the way God has been from his creation we see him creating on the sixth day. On the seventh day, he is there walking in the cool of the evening. He's always been a personal God. In Exodus 6, 3, he's going to say, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, as God Almighty, El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, Yah, I was not known to them. So you look back at it going, did God ever convey that he loved them? Did God ever convey? What intimate things did God convey? It really wasn't intimate. It really wasn't a, a personal shepherd with the sheep type of thing. It, it was more of Melchizedek or the wrestler who messed up your, your hip for life or, you know, through dreams. But He's, as an essence, saying they've known God as God Almighty, the Lord of hosts. But they've never known the way God is going to know. We're going to get to chapter 3. And it says, Moses talked to God as one man talks to another man face to face. That's the way it's translated. In the Hebrew, it literally is mouth to mouth. <laughs> yeah. I, from this point forward, 
the nation of Israel is going to see me laughing and weeping and holding and knowing the most intimate details, being intimately involved with passion of anger, passion of happiness, passion of discipline, passion of blessings. I'm going to be intimately known with them from this point forward. But do notice back up there. Oh, my son's sending me a video of my kid skiing. That's nice. So let's go back up there. Remember earlier he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now notice in verse 15, he says it three times. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. They all three were very different dispensations, weren't they? Abraham lived at a time of the promised land that was unique. And what God did with Abraham was unique. And then there was another dispensation of time with Isaac, and that was unique. You know what we saw? We did see this. These guys were a mess, and God stuck with them. <laughs> you know? I mean, Abraham made a mess of things. Isaac made a mess of things. Jacob, uh, I don't know if he ever straightened up. It was a mess from the start till the end. The ending. It, it was just a very messy thing. There was never a point in time going, man, Abraham was a pauper, but now look at it, he's a king. Look at Isaac. He was a fool, but now he's the wisest man on earth. Look at Jacob, he was a hill catcher and now he's this amazing guy. You, you, you don't get that. You know what I do get though? It's like, wow, I am an Abraham. I am an Isaac, I am a Jacob. And, and God hangs out with those kind of people. He calls them, he blesses them. He, he, he says from now and in, into the infinite future, I'll be your God. And into the infinite future, children of Israel, will be my people. Hey, isn't that radical? In the new heavens, you can read it in Revelation, the whole heavens are built around the knowledge of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing, but he says, I'm, I, I, it was, it, I was Abraham's God. I was Isaac's God. I was Jacob's God. And then with Joseph and his, and, or excuse me, Jacob and his 12 sons and, and that whole dispensation. And now 400 years has is, is gone by until the sins, the wickedness of the Amorites has been fulfilled. And now I'm taking you back into the promised land. But this time and forever, it's going to be different. It's actually going to be better. You are going to know me as, yes, the eternal God, but I am a God in a personal way. The third thing is that I am whatever you need. I am that I am. I am whatever that need is in your life. Do you need health? Then I'll be the God who heals you. You need bread? I'll be the God that gives you bread. I'll, I'll be that thing that you need. And thus we have all these names through the Bible, through the Old Testament. I don't know if I got them all complete here. But Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. Their Lord, my provider. We used to sing that song. We used to say Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh. You guys remember anybody know that song? How many old, old Calvary people? There's a few. My provider, the, your grace is sufficient for me. I love that. Yah Jireh. Yah Rapha, God who heals. Yah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Yah Ma Kedish. The Lord who sanctifies. Yah Shalom, God our peace. Yah Elohim, the Lord our God. Yah Tidskinu, the Lord our righteousness. Yah Raha, or Rahe, the Lord our shepherd. Yah Shama, the Lord is there. Yah Saboth, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of our Sabbath. And then God, God, um, Elyon, 
God Most High. El Roy, God of Seeing. El Olam, Everlasting God. El Gabor, God of the Mighty God. It's interesting because you say, wow, those are cool things. But then Jesus comes on the scene. After 400 years of silence, Jesus comes on the scene. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist says. And then Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospel of John, and he begins to say, guys, Abraham, rejoice. In in, in John 8, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. They're like going, you're not even 50 years old. He had a hard life. He he was 30 at the time, (laughs) okay? And they're like, yeah, you're not even 50. It's like, I'm not sure how old you are, but Jesus had a hard life. A man acquainted with grief and sorrow. He's somewhere around 50 in their minds, not over that, but somewhere in that ballpark. You're not even 50, and you, you, you said you've seen Abraham, and then Jesus said, surely I say to you, before Abraham was, and he said it in such a way. Hayah, Asher, Hayah. I am that I am. And what did they do? Verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him. And then in chapter 10, the Jews, as they were taking up stones, once again to stone him, said, many good works I've done. What are you, which one are you stoning me for? And they said, we're stoning you for blasphemy because you being a man, make yourself God. If anybody ever says, Jesus never claimed to be God, ridiculous. Eight times in the gospels, Jesus continued with this Statement coming right out of Genesis 3. I am. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Now, as we look at this and we continue on in this, we're going to learn something very important. Moses got it. I don't know if anybody else ever got it. But remember when God came to Abraham in there in chapter 15, he said, I am your shield. I am your exceedingly reward. Well, kids. Now, kids is what is my reward. That's my legacy. And he's like, if you have kids, if you know what's happening, you're going to know kids aren't going to do it either. But what do we get when we come to John 6? Jesus says to the children of Israel in Exodus and all the way through, it's me, it's me that you're longing for. But remember they came out and there was no water and they're gonna get all mad at Moses. And and, and then finally, we know the story, Moses brings water out of a rock, right? Or the Lord does through Moses and they drink it. And then they go on and they get all mad again because And then eventually that rock begins to follow them. And what do we learn in 2 Corinthians 10? He says, and that rock that followed them was Christ. You see, it's not God is what I need him to be. I am that I am. Well, I need water. Not really. You need Jesus to fill that thirst So as you're drinking the water to realize, and that water is Christ. The manna, we need manna, came right out of heaven. Supernaturally, just one step outside their tent, a few feet, there's enough to take care of them and their family all day long. And what does Jesus say in John 6? Well, Moses gave up our father's bread to eat in the wilderness. And what does Jesus say in John 6? Moses gave you squat. My father gave that manna. And they ate it. And what happened? They died. And Jesus says, this is why. Because they didn't understand it was me. You see, they ate the manna while they were 40 years dying in the wilderness of unbelief. So even if they're eating the bread, Jesus 
is the I am what you need to eat, bread, to fulfill you, which is your vegetables, your steak, your, it's everything you need in this one bread, this one heavenly bread. But you ate it without ever eating Christ. And Jesus says, I now am giving you, the Father's giving you the real manna. So whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, they will have everlasting life. For my flesh is the real manna. My blood is the real drink. They all freaked out and left. <laughs> there you go. Your mega church season is over, Jesus. You had it so good. You had thousands and now you have nobody following you anymore. The apostles are barely online. But see, they didn't get that. God gave us the Bible. How many people are going to be going to hell or in the tribulation period with a Bible from their great-great-grandparents still on their coffee table? How many people have read the Bible even? Satan sure has. He knows it well. And they've never experience Christ. <laughs> they never ate of the word to the point where they are in fellowship with Jesus through the eating of the word. You see, if we sing some songs, that could be as far as it goes. Or we could be eating and drinking Christ and holding him and him holding us and truly putting incense on the plate uh, the prayers of the saints that are beautiful and the Lord burning them as a sweet smell of aroma that he can answer them and do great and mighty things we know not of. You see, he's saying they never, your fathers, you know, oh, we need water, give them water. Oh, we need protection, you give him protection. Oh, we, but they, they never truly ate it up. Even when Abraham was there with Melchizedek and he knew this is, a, this is an amazing moment. Jesus, giving Abraham communion, bread and wine, gave him, but he didn't have that communion with God because the very next chapter, he is angry and upset and bummed that he didn't have children. And Jesus is saying, bread and wine, me, there, the king of Salem, the priest of the most high God, and and. It didn't even last the day. The very next day, you're upset that, that when I've given you myself. You see, this is where it comes back. Is Jesus Yahweh to us? Have we ate of that bread? Oh, Jesus is the bread of life. No, have we ate up of Jesus? That's why I really have a hard time with in communion of just saying, yeah, here's some bread, here's some wine. Let's remember Christ. Okay, next, what's next on the agenda? Because I do think it is something far more than just a moment in time of eating some bread and some drink and remembering Jesus died and rose again. I do think there can be that moment in communion where we eat up Christ, drink up Christ. He has us and we have him and we walk away rather than being weakened, we're strengthened. Rather than being sick, we're healed. Rather than dying because we're taking communion unworthily, there's this newness of life, this fresh living water being poured out of the rock again and again. Well, chapter 6, he says, I'm the bread of life. I am. And in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And in John 10, he says, I am the door. And then, of course, in Revelation, he says, I'm the one who shuts doors that no man can enter in, and I'm the man that opens doors that no man can shut. Remember that? I am the good shepherd. Is Jesus your shepherd? There's, there's times that I honestly would completely lose hope on this earth if I didn't sense and feel that the Lord really is my shepherd. I saw a thing the other day, it was just like 30 seconds on YouTube of a cast sheep. You know, sheep, if they fall down, they can't get back up. 
And this was just a sheep on its side and there was another sheep <laughs> all getting anxious around it. And the shepherd came over and he pulled on this sheep and, and it, it was near death and it moved and then he helped it to get over on its side and get up and, and it moved around like a drunk sheep for a while until the toxins got out of its system. There, there's evolution for you. Sheep wouldn't be here if evolution was true because a, a, shepherd, a sheep can't make it without shepherds. The Lord's our shepherd. Boy, we need that shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Remember that? He who believes in me will live. And, and even though he dies, he whoever lives believes in me will never die. I want G Jesus, give me eternal life. No, no, no. I am your eternal life. Eternal isn't a period of time because people in hell live for eternity. They're going to be eternally living in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. No, it's not time. It's a quality where I'm in Jesus and Jesus in me and I am in him. I remember in, in, in John or in Acts 17, Paul comes to that place and he says, hey, I see you have a, a, another, you built this thing to an unknown God. That's the one I'm gonna preach about. Because people used to not know Yahweh. But now I want to preach about Yahweh. We used to have, a, he, Jews had a name they couldn't even say. But now we know it and we say it, Jesus. And he preached Christ to them there about that unknown God. But what did he say? We came to understand in him we live and move and have our being. Oh, that's Yahweh. With Jesus is our Yahweh, that's it. In him we live and move and have our being. What is eternal life? Jesus. If Jesus is in you, you have eternal life right now. If you are in Jesus, you have eternal life right now, right? Father, as I am in you and you are in me, that we would be in them and them in us in a perfect unity. That's eternal life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, it's not a road sign. It's not a direction. It's not a map. What did he say? Well, there in John 14, well, what do you mean we know the way? We have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> What's the way? You never told us which, <laughs> where's the map? And what did he say to him? I am the way, the truth, and life. It is me. It's not a road sign. It's me. I am the vine, you are the branches. What's that mean? In him we live and move and have our being. As the vine, the branches abide in the vine, then it all works. I love that last one there in John 18 where they're coming to the garden and they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth and he says, um, whom are you seeking, Jesus asked. They had any idea that the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who spoke light into existence, is asking them, whom do you seek? And what does he say to them? I am. And they fall backwards and draw back and fell to the ground. Well, we will end there tonight and pick up in verse 16 and go through chapter 4 next week.